Thanks for joining us today. Um, our panel is stories from the SOC front lines. Um, and as primer, many women in cyber have historically had perhaps roles in policy, GRC, quote unquote, softer roles in cyber. But increasingly, the numbers of women that are moving into more technical roles, technical cyber roles and SOC operations roles is growing, yay. We have a great panel of women here as SOC leaders themselves representing three different industries to share a little bit about their career journeys, security ops, war stories, um, and discuss how companies and orgs can expand talent, develop pipeline, and create new opportunities for um, expanding our talent and our workforce in cyber operations from a DEI perspective, diversity and inclusion perspective. My name is Tiffany Kleeman. I am the emerging growth leader for our cyber and strategic risk business at Deloitte. Uh, and super excited to introduce these three women. We have to my immediate right, Anne Baron Di Camillo, uh, who's a managing director and the global head of cyber operations at Citi. We have Jenny Mena, who's the vice president for threat management and response at Humana. And we have Kimberly Sanders, Kim, who is the BSO, the business information security officer and ops for Amtrak. So, with that, I'm just going to advance our slides. And as was mentioned by Bree, we're going to be spending quite a bit of time allowing for Q&A because we know and have received, we receive feedback, right, regularly from the RSA conference that that's really what a lot of you are looking for um, in a lot of these sessions. But to start, I would like for each of you, if you could, to spend a few minutes each talking about your kind of career journey up to this point and how you found yourself in security operations. Well, sure, thank you, Tiffany, and thank you for uh, putting together this panel. I'm very excited to be here and back at RSA. I think it's been, gosh, five plus years um, you know, through COVID and other experiences. It's been a bit of a time, so excited to be back in the city and having an opportunity to connect with colleagues, you know, both current as well as former. I just saw um, a colleague that I worked with back in my DOD days uh, over in one of the, uh, um, Joe Wolfco, if anybody knows Joe, um, and JC Wilson uh, from my DISA days. So it, it's just great mm -hmm. to be back in this community. It really is a tight knit community and I'm really grateful for, for being, being here with these wonderful women, continuing to grow our network. Um, I think that's another awesome opportunity of coming together at events like RSA. So thank you for putting this together. Um, as Tiffany said, I am Anne Verandicamello. I am the Managing Director and Global Head for Cyber Operations at Citi. Um, small little job, you know, not a whole lot going on. It's pretty, you know, pretty, uh, pretty, uh, pretty, you know, vanilla days, I'll just say. Yeah. We operate in 165 different countries, so our threat la landscape is, is quite large um, when you think about that. Uh, we, I have a team that's in 26 different countries, and so, um, you know, looking at the regulatory landscape to, um, you know, the, the threat environment and, and the marriage between the two um, makes cyber operations at, at City um, an interesting place to be. It's a really, um, we, we, you know, our regulars don't like it when we use the word complex, but it is a bit of a complex operating uh, environment <laughs> at, at City. And uh, we have a, a number of different lines of business which further kind of complicate, you know, kind of the aspects associated with that. Um, so my organization is, is really everything front lines in cyber. Um, the, the SOC organizations 24-7, um, incident response, forensics, um, you know, insider threat, DLP, any kind of ops cyber function is part of my organization. We call those kind of the blue team. Those are their 24-7 teams um, that, that operate there. Kind of on the other side is our more offensive or red team type organizations, pen testing, AppSec, um, you know, reverse engineering, really trying to get ahead of the vulnerabilities that are coming from the environment and, and then looking internally to see, you know, what do the controls look like? What is our efficacy associated with our controls against, you know, X, Y, Z, uh, I think most recently spring, another spring, um, uh, uh, I'm forgetting the, the, uh, the campaign. Yes, yes, Spring yeah. Shell. There it is. 
it's been a busy day or lots of discussions. I'm losing my words. Um, but yeah, so that was a, a, a more recent one, an example of the kind of things that we do where we really try to, to look not just for the you know, CVE score, but what does it look like internal to our organization? How do our controls map against um, the, the vectors? You know, is this really something that, that's exploitable for us? So that team does a lot of that more, um, uh, I would say it's preventive, but it's uh, really trying to, to ensure that we have the protection capabilities. And they'll even come up with you know, measures as we wait for hot fixes and other kinds of things. And, and they work really closely with vendors um, to get ahead of that, we, we call that shifting left. And in the middle of my organization is our cyber fusion centers, and that's where we have this marriage of the business partners, fraud partners, legal partners, um, business ethics, uh, all part of the, that organization there, sitting with my operators, with the vulnerability teams, the, the SAST and the DAST, and, and really making sure that if we have a bad day, we have all the right personnel co-located um, virtually as well as uh, physically to, to really ensure that we can address that quickest. We have threat intelligence and exercises that really make sure that our plans um, operate per the perspective that we want to um, ensure that we have. And, and so, um, again, small organization, not a lot going on. But, um, but I've been at City for about two and a half years. Previous to that, um, I was at Amex for about four plus years where I ran a very similar organization. Um, but the first 20 years of my career, I spent in national security um, and U.S. government. Um, it's interesting, I started off on the Hill. I, I, I went to school um, thinking I would become a, a lawyer in um, political science. Um, I think I was quickly disillusioned by politics and um, pivoted over to, um, uh, you know, I had an opportunity to um, do some HTML development for the, the, uh, the congressman at the time. It was when we were, everyone was getting into a digital presence. And so the U.S. Department of Agriculture had some courses on HTML development, and I could take them free as a government employee. So I went over and took some classes there, and I, I really thought, you know, this is a career I, I might like a lot more than politics, since I was quickly becoming disillusioned there. Um, fast forward, I uh, ended up getting my master's in information systems and computer science, and um, I, I worked in a number of system integrators within the Beltway. I spent some time at Department of Defense up at um, the fort, and then my last position um, before I left federal government, federal service was at U.S. Um, CERT. I was the director there, where I um, helped respond to a few you know, events you might have heard about, the OPM uh, data breach. Uh, we were uh, a shared partner in helping them respond to that. Another one I got to testify was um, the healthcare.gov uh, event. It was really fun to testify before Congress and, and be asked uh, if I was colluding with the White House, a little bit of a yeah, a little bit of a politics there, but no, it was it was a great experience overall. Um, I really appreciate the relationships that I still have to this day. I think cyber is a team sport, and so one of the things I, I think is so important for us to be effective, it's the collective. Um, it's not just my my peers at City. It's my peers within finance. It's my peers within the U.S. government. It's my peers within the NCSC um, and MAS and others that we really we come together and we help. Um, help each other. I think I always say one person's detection is another's prevention. And one of the things that we do really well in our sector um, in finance is information sharing. I, I'm also dual headed. I'm the chair of the board for FSISAC. And so it's another great opportunity um, to really help share um, information across the community and ensure that, again, one person's detection becomes another's prevention and, and that we can leverage the, the collective to really help uh, thwart threat actors. I, I think we have um, really cunning and, and motivated threat actors, be it cyber criminals, a nation state, or hacktivists. Who would have thought that hacktivists would be something that I care about? But in the last you know, 18 months, they've become a whole different side of, of threat. Um, and then just the whole proliferation of ransomware and how we're seeing that go. So I think the, the number one thing I would say in, in the discussion like this is the partnerships that I have with these women um, and being successful in my job and, and, the, and helping my team uh, and, and accomplish our collective goals is, is really going to be paramount. Um, I've learned that throughout my career, both in public and private, um, that it really is a team sport and, um, and we're, mo we're most effective when we work collaboratively together. So thank you for putting this together. I look forward to the discussions and um, for uh, questions from the audience. Thanks, Anne. Jenny? Great. Um, well, it's funny, listening to Anne describe her role, I thought I was the only one that had a weirdly structured organization that had the red team and the pen testers and the security operations. Um, All together. So, so I have a, a, a very similar structure. I have the incident response, the SOC, the vulnerability management, the threat intel, um, and the, as well as the offensive security. 
um, which still makes me a little bit twitchy to call it offensive security <laughs> after actually, the yeah. Operation Op Ababil years where people were threatening to send people to jail for hacking back, but now I guess it just means Tempest and Red Team, so I'm yep. okay. I've gone along with my team. Um, and then I have kind of the sim engineering and what we call, and it makes them so happy. Um, we let them call themselves the death team, the detection engineering and threat hunting, and so they can have, <laughs> you know, so the grim cool. reaper on all their stuff, yeah, and it just hilarious. sparks joy in the team, and so it's worth dealing with the looks I get from HR. <laughs> um, so I am at Humana, been there for a little over two and a half years. Um, when I first came into Humana, I did GRC for about a year. I had never had that as a pure role. I'd had it acting before, and I will tell you, I was very excited. Um, when I had the opportunity to go back into the operations space. But it's good to learn all those different things. Um, in terms of background, also fairly similar to Anne, I started off with a degree in Russian civilization and one in international relations. I worked in international development consulting for about a year and a half, and I hated it. But one of the projects that I had was building, um, you know, Russia had just become an independent country. We wanted them to be a good guy. There was that brief period where we were buddies. Um, and so they were trying to build a land titling and registration system. So I got a little bit into IT. Um, I fled that company, went to what was a systems development integration company, worked primarily in health systems, and the information assurance cybersecurity started to be a part of those things. And so one of the customers did not like the legitimately qualified person who was the security officer for this major federal system and asked me to do it. Um, so I got kind of a crash course working with NIST and NSA to figure out how to make this system secure. Went back to more IT and then after 9-11 found myself um, recruited into the being stood up Department of Homeland Security that was trying to part, basically populate itself with contractors in the new headquarters function. And so I spent nine years, um, I, th I was a senior executive that I think had every cybersecurity role in DHS except on the in-house CISO side. Um, I was a director of US CERT. I, you were my immediate successor because yep. I know I hired you for <laughs> a different role and then moved back to my more of the kind of uh, threat information sharing, public private work. Um, moved from there to US Bank. I was the deputy CISO at US Bank. And then it seemed like when COVID came along and I got a call from a recruiter about a healthcare company that maybe it was a sign that I should try going back into health a little bit. Um, Humana is from a, a threat perspective and an operations perspective. For those who aren't familiar, right, we're an insurance company, but also care delivery that operate under a variety of different names all over the country. We have pharmacy, mail order pharmacy. Um, so you can imagine the control systems associated with that might have some risk. We also operate the big TRICARE contract um, which impacts our threat landscape. And we buy companies like crazy. Sometimes they're large companies. Sometimes it's like Dr. Nick's dialysis clinic of South Florida, right? So you can imagine the level of sophistication in IT and security of these companies that we're rolling in. And the second the ink is dry and something happens at one of these places, it's your problem. Um, and so that has been really kind of a wild ride, dealing with all of these different wholly owned subsidiaries and recently purchased companies um, with a variety of different incidents and frankly knowledge of their environment when we're trying to deal with it. Um, we do a ton of, I had three significant third party incidents last week. Um, anybody else dealing with a lot of third party ransomware in the past couple months? Like, oh law my firms? God. Anybody have a law firm? So it is an interesting mixed bag. Um, and I think I, the good news is I have a little bit more ability to, to share some of the war stories um, from my current and previous job that I've been blessed to have a little bit more calm, corporate comms than some of the other folks. So look forward to sharing some of those. All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kim Sanders. I'm currently the Business Information Security Officer for Amtrak. I started my career in, originally as a grants analyst. Um, I, I was their, uh, their shadow IT and became their IT by being hired by the company. And then ultimately, I transitioned over to Amtrak when I realized that trains and planes and anything that was transportation was really what drove me and what I was most interested in. So one of the neat things about Amtrak is that we are a fairly large organization. We are across the United States of America. Um, we also have some trains that run up into Canada. My roles there have ranged from um, being a analyst where I was able to do some pen testing on the at-grade crossings, as well as some of our locomotives, which is always a lot of fun. 
Um, and then I transitioned into leading our security operations center for two and a half years during COVID, which was quite a challenging time for all of us. And now I'm in the, visit, the BISO role. Um, so that's a little bit about, about me. Awesome. Badass. <laughs> um, so, <clears throat> one of the things that, and I'll kind of kick us off, but really this is open Q&A for everybody, and we've got some questions here that we can, you know, um, answer as well. But one of the questions that's kind of coming up is, you know, frequently that I'm hearing about are, you know, what, what are some of the hotter topics or issues related to security operations today? Um, and if you want to, you know, strum a little bit on kind of where that's going, you know, where we think it's evolving to, it'd be great to get your perspectives on that. So I'll start. Um, I think uh, Jenny touched on it, the third party, uh, so the third party area is definitely something that I think is creating a lot of gray hairs for us. Um, because the, the way that we look at third parties is from a compliance perspective. Um, obviously it's mandated and it's regulated, but we, that sometimes doesn't really get to where we need to go. And I think when you have you know, thousands of third parties, um, specifically when you leverage certain vendors that are heavily targeted by ransomware campaigns because of their likelihood of pain, um, it just makes that whole process much more difficult. Um, to kind of keep ahead of that. I think we've seen a, a shift in the threat landscape and the ransomware campaigns that is directly impacting certain third parties more than others. I think I saw a stat recently where 50% of the DSL sites named and shamed um, are law firms right now. So they're, um, have, they're used by all of us, um, but yet they're probably one of the most targeted sectors right now. And so I think we're all trying to, to deal with what is the impact associated with that data if it were to be leaked, what is the impact associated with that um, to, to the firm, to you know, even fourth party um, mm -hmm. relationships that we have associated with those kinds of entities, and, and then how can we mitigate that in a more actionable way? Um, a lot of great discussions are being had here at RSA around how we can collectively work with peers, how we can work with industry partners, and how we can work with vendors around that, but I think there's still a lot of growth in that space, and it seems as soon as we address it, either regulation changes about how the reporting is or the threat actors are you know, further ahead making kind of those, those processes um, obsolete or no longer as effective. And so I think the, the rapid evolving threat landscape in that space has just made it a little bit more difficult than we've seen in previous years. And the fact that you know, now they're using triple extortion, you know, so there's the ransomware and then there's the naming and shaming and now they're jossing these entities. And so how do you help some of these small and medium sized businesses through that as a, as a, as a peer, as a, as a partner, uh, as a stakeholder to them as well? And so, and what are those bounds in which you can do? Um, at, you know, our, our legal department has clearly told me I cannot give advice to our, our partners and our stakeholders, but um, how can we help them through that when they are less sophisticated? And I think that's where I see organizations like the ISACs can really come in and help um, you know, in helping share information from the city, it helps, you know, um, uh, it helps credit unions, you know, teachers' credit unions, it helps a lot of smaller entities that don't have the access to the, the skills and talent um, and tooling that we have at city. So I think as we see that landscape evolving, we see these campaigns change, that becomes even more important to make sure you have information sharing to help those that maybe are lesser fortunate. Mm -hmm. But then you have to do it in a way that doesn't create noise in their environment. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't have a way to consume that and action it, it just becomes noise and, and you know um, it hits the floor and it's not effective. So I think those are some of the areas that we're trying to tackle, um, leveraging you know the more sophisticated institutions, uh, leveraging partners in, in government, leveraging you know industry, technology vendors to kind of help solve the problem because it's the weakest link that uh, a lot of times is the one that we're we're most concerned about. And, and we don't always have the um, visibility into um, their environment that would help us understand that you know, the next open source vulnerability is going to be something that they're gonna be impacted by. And that's kind of leading to another question or another aspect. I think the open source landscape is, is an area of concern. We have um, 40,000 developers at City and um, we develop on a lot of uh, um, operating systems, languages, you, know, you name it, and a lot of legacy. And so when you have that large population, um, getting your hands around kind of the, the embedded aspects associated with your development stacks is, is also a tricky, uh, a tricky thing to, to, to tackle. 
um, a great technology again and partnerships um, coming in that area. There's a lot of vendors that we work with that are just doing tremendous work and, and really helping us tackle that. But sometimes at the end of the day, it's a, a lot of Herculean efforts. And so kind of back to the fundamental thing I think we probably all deal with is, is talent. How do we get the talent in to, to help us tackle this? Because sometimes it really is just you know throwing bodies at a problem and making sure that we have skilled talent um, that we're working with um, uh, with contractors and, and vendors, partners like uh, Deloitte and others to help us uh, through those events and, and when we need to surge. And so I think the, the landscape is kind of, it, it's so evolving and so changing that there's no one issue that I think of. I think of probably a dozen um, that keep me up at night, um, but they, they really do come down to the external kind of landscape, I, I think is, is where there's more concern just because there's, our, our, our footprint has extended so much further than the boundaries of city. And so that's kind of the area of, 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 of concentrated focus, I would say for us. Thank you. A real quick show of hands, because I know we've mentioned ISACs. How many are familiar with the ISACs? Some of you, so it might be okay. beneficial yep, to maybe sure. to explain. So FSISAC yeah. is the Financial Services Information Sharing Analysis Center. It was stood up in like 1998, um, and basically it's the so there's 16 critical infrastructures across the the government that the government has recognized. Finance is one of them. Um, water, um, other energy. Um, mm -hmm. uh, there's the de defense industrial base. A number of different sectors that have been identified as critical. Um, 80 or 85 percent of them are run by private industry. And so one of the things that um, the finance or financial sector did is they stood up the ISAC back in, you know, back before 9-11, and I think it accelerated after that with the, the adoption of ISACs and other sectors. But it was really to do that collective information sharing, again, prevention to detection. And so it's an opportunity for, I think there's over 5,000 members globally in the ISAC and the financial sector um, that are participating in working groups and information sharing and threat intelligence briefings and summits that we have and other kinds of things to bring together that network again for the collective defense associated with cyber. So that's how the, the cyber or the FSI SAC is. I know we're also members of um, the defense industrial um, base ISAC, which does a very similar um, uh, collective associate with your sector. So ISACs are really to help bring together that, that vertical um, of peers and then help the collective benefit from the, the uh, information that is shared therein. Great, thank you. And it's encouraged by our regulatory bodies, you know, globally to engage in those as well. Right, so obviously you're here at RSA, you're getting great information, but you know, there are other forums throughout the year, right, that you can align to, to be able to get better information sharing on a more consistent basis. And those ISACs also have bodies within them that are also available to you to share more operational information. And so not just around policies and regulatory kind of frameworks, et cetera, but actual IOCs. threat information sharing, et cetera, also. Jenny? You yeah, and I think it's not just the threat that is useful, but also, okay, we're all seeing, for example, there was a series of ransomware DDoS attacks about a year and a half ago for companies to say, this is how I'm mitigating it, this worked, this didn't, this is where some of the fallback plans are succeeding and failing so that you're not remaking other people's mistakes. Um, so I've, I was first thinking of taking the answer to this question toward um, what we're doing with SOAR to try to deal with the volume of data and get our mean time to detect and mean time to respond down. Um, I was also thinking about, I know a lot of companies are debating, um, you know, do you, do you outsource? Do you re-insource? Do you go overseas? Do you, you know, do you go offshore? Do you go near shore? Um, and that's something that we're going back and forth on how you get to 24 seven, make sure the people are actually working, staying working, um, trained properly because of the tremendous turnover in some of these fields because the market is so hot. Um, but then Anne uh, touched on something that I wanted to kind of talk to the group about that we're dealing with on a, um, in a third party perspective. And what we found is it's, um, just in the last couple weeks, right, we've had two of our call center vendors that we rely on. Um, we also had a vendor that provides meals to, you know, elderly Medicare type customers. 
and we find out, you know, you get the letter or you get some business person that sends you an email and says, I think you're a security person, what do I do with this, right? That it said I have a ransomware attack. And what we're finding is that the security operations team who's trying to understand, okay, what are the potential, do we have any emails, do we have any IOCs, is there any potential contagion, are we gonna shut these people down? You know, what are the different rules here? Um, how will we know and get an attestation that makes us comfortable to continue doing business with them? We're also facilitating the conversation with the business people of, okay, have you actually thought about the service that these people <coughs> provide and what are you going to do if they get shut off? And how do you bring the right people together and make those trade-off decisions when you could literally have health and safety issues or you know, real life issues for people who are receiving care or you know, potentially food insecurity? What if none of our you know, clinics can call into the call center that they need to discuss things with providers or to clear you get a procedure? Um, and we find ourselves kind of pushing on how the financial sector tends to have much more, the true financial sector, I would call it, tends to have much more mature risk management teams within the business units. That's something that I find is pretty weak in healthcare. So we find ourselves trying to facilitate those conversations and what are we gonna do about it? And there's a lot of negotiation there on the business side. Um, so again, if there are people that are like, I wanted to talk about SIM and SOAR and we're in the process of doing a SIM transition and implementing SOAR and we move to a near shore or to a, um, a US based low cost tier one um, outsource, and we're kind of dealing with some different you know, pros and cons with that. So if you guys wanna move in that direction as opposed to some of the more kind of thread and substantive, happy to, to go in any of those directions. So I think for me, I think I'll take this question a little bit differently. Um, when it comes to some of the hotter topics that we're, we're seeing lately, um, it really digs into Intel-driven detection. Um, so really taking that Intel, that you, the finished Intel products, extracting the adversary procedures, figuring out where your gaps are as far as your detection capabilities, and then turning that on its head and figuring out how you can best adjust your alerting to come back and be able to detect those in the future. Um, some of the other really hot topics right now in some of the critical infrastructure organizations um, is really taking S-bombs, your, your security bill, your mm -hmm. software bill of materials, sorry mm -hmm. about that. Um, taking those S-bombs and taking the information from that that's typically something that your vulnerability management team is always focused on, and from a security operations perspective, learning about how you can turn that into detection measures. And then I think I'll, I'll sort of wrap it up here and close it out with the last item, which would be um, really from a control systems perspective, taking things such as the, um, the, the top 20 secure coding PLC best practices, and from a security operations perspective, also taking those and understanding what the adversaries are looking to do and then using that for your detection measures. So ultimately enhancing those detection measures in three different ways for the security ops center. Kim, to what extent are you spending more time on things related to like OT, IOT, sure, so, IOT? So early on, um, we weren't spending very much time um, in that. My background is industrial control system cybersecurity and moving into the SOC, that was one of the things where the SOCs are traditionally IT focused. Um, and one of the things that I tried to do was turn that into more of a OT focus within the IT SOC. So we were able to train up our, sca our staff to understand better all of the complexities of operational control systems and understanding how best we can get that. And I'd say as of right now, we're maybe 50-50 um, because we do have a team now that provides us with the capability for OT detections. Awesome. So it's really grown over the years. Interesting. The tooling is also going to help you with that, right? I'm sorry? The tooling is also going to help you with that? Yes, yes, yes definitely yeah. yes. It, that's advanced, there. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, all right, open to questions. So there are microphones <coughs> here. Uh, feel free to come on up and get in line, or if you're not able or don't want to get up, you can also raise your hand, and we've got a microphone that can come to you. So, yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Alex Arabrina. I'm a corporate operations engineer at Google. Um, I do IT help desk type of stuff, not security, but I am interested in security. My question is regarding um, how do we get people um, to apply for roles in like your companies 
when it seems like the job description is like way too advanced, like even mm -hmm. for IT, I saw a description that asked for five years of experience for an entry level IT role. And when it comes to cybersecurity stuff, it's like, oh, you need a master's in computer science, yeah. you need like right. 10 years experience of managing system. Mm -hmm. And it's just like a huge barrier for people who want to get in the field. What are you planning to do to reduce that barrier or potentially targeting non-traditional applicants such as uh, career switchers, folks who don't have a degree at all, and maybe people like uh, neurodivergent people? Thank you. Awesome. Great question. Can I yeah. add on? We have, so you hit on exactly an area that um, when I came to City, I noticed that all of our tier one analysts, this is our very most entry level analyst role in my organization, required three years of experience. How do you get three years of experience for an entry level role, right? You know, you're not going to get three years of experience in college, so, you know, kind of what's the gap between even two to three years, right? And, and, and you know, if you come out of a certificate program or a university. And so we created an apprentice program. And we, um, the first year we did it, we had um, 150 applicants. And it basically, it was, we selected, I think, six people from that. And we focused on diverse um, individuals as well. And we wanted to give them an opportunity to come in and work across six month rotations across four different operational teams within my organization. And then at the end of that, they'd have the two years of experience to then select where they wanted to go. So we're into year two, you know, we selected six the first year. Last year we had, I think we had close to a thousand applicants, maybe even more, and we had 11 that we were able to, to hire from that. Sometimes we're actually able to hire folks from that pool into other roles as well. But from the first year, um, two or three of them have already selected their permanent role. So you don't have to go through all four rotations, and you've had an opportunity to get to know a manager, and they've had an opportunity to get to know you. So how do you take that and grow that, right? To your point, that's something that we've done, still not meeting the need associated with folks that are coming out of school or out of these programs that don't have that two to three years of experience. Mm -hmm. um, there's some announcements that are coming out today about some innovation um, from, uh, some training programs where I think it's called Million Man is, is something you can look up. But um, it's basically trying to train folks that are exactly in that, that point. And it's leveraging online training to, um, so as a, as a, as a enterprise you know, leader, I can give them maybe five of my junior entry level positions and tell them the kinds of requirements that I, I'm looking for. And they'll create the type of um, skill assessment for that within their platform. And then um, as an applicant, I can go in and I can you know, show my skill assessment and they can say, you really need training in you know, X, Y, and Z. And then it's provided for them for free. So that way, at the end of that process, you might not be an applicant on day one, but you could be an applicant that's considered qualified three months into that process. Or maybe it's only you know, 30 days, you're able to just kind of finalize some things. And then that's given over to the hiring manager at the different enterprises. So this is a new initiative that's coming out. I'd say look up Million Man. It's supposed to be announced today here at RSA. And it, it's something that he, we at City are looking to partner with because I think it's a tremendous opportunity specifically to, to help disadvantaged um, uh, uh, entry level you know, individuals that just don't have that experience and it's kind of helping leapfrog. So I think there's more and more programs like that that are coming out. And, and you know, we want to collectively look to see what we can do that's happening in the, in the industry that where we can invest in and partner as well. So I think if you're hearing of other things that we should be aware of, we'd also love to hear about that. Yeah, and I would add, um, because um, there are a number of organizations out there, Cyversity is a great one that has all sorts of training and scholarships and helps make those connections. But one thing that I find missing when I talk to people coming in is this, people seem to think there's one path into security and it's going and getting like an entry level, you know, security plus or whatever. Um, and, and getting a job as like a tier one SOC analyst. There are hundreds of different kinds of jobs in security. And so, for example, I ran into a, a teacher who did cybersecurity awareness training for middle schoolers that she taught, and she was thinking she needed to go get some sort of a tier one SOC training to break into security. I said, no, you could do security awareness training mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. You would be qualified for that. And so rather than trying to take everybody who wants to go into the field and ramming them into one funnel, um, you know, we just did a whole workforce modernization where we changed our position descriptions. We stripped out the stuff that those HR people love to put in about X number of years experience and a bachelor's degree and whatever um, that are just in like the can template where they added the word cyber. Um, so I think it's looking more broadly about how you get in the door. 
One thing that we do in addition to an internship program where we do rotations is we created something called Avenues. And Avenues is, for example, if you were a you know, tier two analyst, DLP analyst, and you always wanted to be a pen tester, you can put your name into the hat, and every time we as a leader open a new position, even if it's a backfill, we get asked, can this go to Avenues? And so if it goes to Avenues, the primary source is somebody inside the company. I'm sorry, I'm making a lot of noise here with my sleeves. Um, they go in there, there's training to go with it, and it's really a commitment to help people build and broaden okay. their skill sets. Um, and it's, it's gone really well. We've had a couple people that weren't meant to be red teamers that moved back to doing other things, um, but it's gone really well. And we've started doing it at higher levels up, not just the entry level, um, but at some of our kind of mid-level management and SME positions too. I, what I love about that is that those things provide opportunity that didn't exist, right? For those maybe, including those disadvantaged, but also for folks that are just like, I just don't know how to get from point A to point B to point C. It's like, well, here's the roadmap. Here are the, the skill sets. And I know at least for, for Deloitte, we're doing something very similar. Uh, we started a cyber badging um, program um, at Deloitte so that you can easily shift from different types of roles um, in support of our clients and, and, and depending on your passions. We're also hiring more people uh, that don't have just four-year degrees, right? If you've got other training and certifications and meet the requirements, we're considering those applicants now as well. Yes. My question was really just a quick clarification on what you said earlier. You said that uh, you leverage uh, S-bombs to oper uh, operationalize the SOC. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could expand a bit on that. Sure, sure. So um, when it comes to understanding the, the software that is built within the systems, and then take software that's part of the, the systems and then taking that information and building out with our threat detection teams how we're able to search for X occurring. And if we notice that something is, is extracting in a location where it's not supposed to, we're able to detect that and pick up on that through, through alerting. Other questions? I have a question. Yeah. Um, I, I, I continuously see leaders and CISOs talk about really advanced and sophisticated threat actors mm -hmm. and adversaries. And so I kind of wanted to ask you guys as a question, do you see adversaries actually evolving and advancing and becoming more sophisticated or is it just our systems and our technologies that are more sophisticated? And, and for Kim specifically, are the adversaries that you see different because you're in OT and different types of technologies? Mm -hmm. So um, for us, we really have somewhat, we do have a little bit of a difference when it comes to the adversaries that we see. Um, and we're able to tell that through some of our intel that we're, we're leveraging. But what it really truly comes down to is a lot of the times the easiest path is the way that they're gonna take in. And that is typically always through the business network, which falls back into our, our normal adversaries that we see and then it translates into something a little different. I would say we're cyber criminals. It's the biggest adversary we see. They're financially motivated. Um, and so, uh, you know, the majority of the top 20 actors that we track are within that, that realm. I think to your question about the sophistication, we do see colluding of cyber criminals with nation state. There's much more, you know, from the intelligence that we track um, in, the, in, the, in the wild, we've seen a lot more collusion over the last few years. Um, that we've seen previously a lot more moonlighting. Mm -hmm. And so that's led to this sophistication. You know, everything's as a service on the dark web. And so I think that's also kind of led to um, a lot of maybe less sophisticated actors five years ago can now put together a really successful and sophisticated campaign because they can buy all, pretty much all of it. Mm -hmm. And then you flip that over to chat GBT and you can say, okay, fix my code. And you've got a pretty, or make this not detectable, right? And so you've taken, um, a sophisticated, or you've taken a, um, a patchwork of things that they bought, and then they've made it like less, ev ev they've made it more evasive. And so I think the technology is is giving us tools to defend and us tools to leverage within our environments, but it's also benefiting threat actors, and they're leveraging it. I would say sometimes even more than we are um, because of the restrictions that we have in place with our, you know. Um, oversight and, and so I think those things you know it's just a, such a rapidly evolving landscape that 
we've seen a huge amount of collusion that we never saw in the past. We information share, but they also do as well. And mm -hmm. so that also kind of levels or brings up the, um, the overall uh, sophistication of threat actors. Yeah, I think so two thoughts on that. One, um, I wonder how many uh, other folks that run security operations and bridges, who is the most frequent threat actor that causes a security bridge to be stood up? Yeah. <laughs> People that work for us that screw Inside stuff up. Yeah, yeah. Stuff. Right, I'm not saying it's all bad guys, there's a lot of stupid that happens, <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> oh, yeah. somebody dragged and dropped a file making a system change and the application can no longer find it and can't or function and you're trying, to, yeah. you're trying to figure out who the bad guy is and in fact, the bad guy is us. Um, <laughs> I will say, and I'll share a fairly detailed story about the sophistication of actors and the benefit of partnership. Um, we had a, uh, the former Conti group, right, broke up. They are now, were then called Roy Zeon. They had a, I don't know if it was a, a PO or a PM, I'm not sure if they were agile. I guess they were agile because of how quickly they were pivoting, but they had a team that was assigned to attack us. We got this from an Intel provider that we had that was really well connected in this actor group. And so the Intel provider would say to us, here's the lore, right? So we'd have the email and they were really good. So they were gonna go to the Medicare, say, I'm making this one up, team. They had 15 people in our company who worked there and they had an email that was coming from somebody that we did business with or a government agency saying, hey, you need to report here for compliance. And so every few days we would get a new lore and a different part of the company. Right, there was one going for the general counsel's office, there was one going through the IT group, including our CIO's secretary. They were pivoting, pivoting, pivoting. Um, and obviously very sophisticated, they knew us, they knew our business. Um, we decided to be as aggressive as possible at dealing with this because they were being so aggressive with us and we reached out to all of our partners. Now I called the government and they were totally useless, um, but thought I would try. Um, reached out to other companies, but we also reached out to our vendors, um, including Microsoft. And so we were, as quickly as we were getting IOCs, we were changing our proof point rules. Um, we get a call from Black Hat for one of our people that is there. I hear the actors pivoted again, it's totally different. And none of our custom detections and proof point worked, it sailed. We saw these emails coming in, but fortunately I had called a friend at Mystic at Microsoft um, and he's like, I, my gosh, like, I, I see it coming in and it's just gone. They had done the research on this actor because they do so much with ransomware there. They got it in Defender. So I texted him, I'm like, did you do something? And he's like, yeah, we were able to protect you and also a bunch of our other customers from this sudden rapid TTP change that none of us were watching out for. So talks about the level of sophistication and the targeting that they're like, we want your company and we're gonna keep trying, um, but also the benefit of mm -hmm. you know, reaching out to all your partners yeah. to try to get help when somebody's coming after you. Uh, so, Anne, I saw you give a talk last year and you kind of suggested that we were reaching peak complexity and things should start to get easier. I, I wasn't here uh, last year. Uh, uh, this was the Venture Summit in September, October. Oh, okay. Um, and I, yeah, so I was just <laughs> I thinking. I don't know it was if like, I said peak complexity. But maybe peak, peak complexity of what we saw at the time. Yeah, and so okay. that, that's kind of like yeah. with ChatGPT right, and all right. these new things and right. geopolitical tensions kind of yeah. still persisting. Mm -hmm. Just curious from your perspective, obviously, you see a lot at City. Mm -hmm. How are things kind of evolving? Are there right and left turns that were unexpected? And mm -hmm. just generally interested in what's kind of happening over the next you know, year, 18 months, two years? Yeah, I think, you know, if you'd asked me a few years ago about hacktivists, they wouldn't even be on my top, you know, 10 list. Um, but the last 18 months has really changed that with the Russia-Ukraine um, conflict. And, you know, the sophistication we saw out of, you know, some of these um, hack for Ukraine um, and the impacts that it can have on kind of unintended consequences, right, of, of entities that have nothing to do with the conflict. Um, and so I think that was a, a, a bit of a, a surprise to, to us and to others, you know, that operate in these complex geographies. Um, and so I think trying to understand um, where the threat actors are going to go next, because we saw a sophistication there, again, that was because of the, you know, volunteerism, you know, the patriotism associated with that, that we, that we were all un unaware of that they could 
collaborate and coordinate um, up until that point. So I think there's the geopolitical aspects that you're talking about that can kind of almost accelerate that sophistication that we hadn't seen previously, mm -hmm. that we saw in the last uh, 12 months that I think was, was a bit surprising. Um, you know, so what's gonna be the next one? You know, we obviously are keeping a close eye on things that are happening in, in, in APAC, and so I think it's one of those things where you know, that area, you know, a speaker's visit to, to Taiwan and what that outcome can have uh, in, in companies that operate in region that maybe are, are you know, headquartered in, in the United States is really kind of changed the way we look at the collective defense that our threat actors can, can cobble together and, mm -hmm. and how they're doing that. So I think, I, I would never say peak, I would say there's a different peak uh, from what we, you know, what I tracked a few years ago um, to what I'm tracking today. Again, because of the collusion that we're seeing in the threat actor landscape to help them better themselves. And then, yeah, add on cheap chat GBT and man, it's, it's, it's definitely um, uh, increasing the sophistication in a way that is, uh, is, is exponential. Awesome, thanks. Sure. I wanted to ask a kind of final question here, which is um, r related to something I'm spending a lot of time <clears throat> with CISOs and, and, and security teams, which is how do we help security teams close the gap between security and the importance of it and tying it to ROI for the business mm -hmm. and impact to the business so that it's not a technical geek speak conversation <laughs> about this many vulnerabilities and this many incidents and this many whatever, but impact to the business. Could you talk a little bit about what you see there and you know some advice that you might have? Sure, well I guess I'll start with that one. Um, when it comes to ROI, simply put, just being able to bring value, show the value that your team is bringing to the table is important. So one of the things, if there is a report that you see that's going up to the top on a weekly basis, see if you can get your metrics in there and make sure that they're easily consumable metrics and that helps the business, the board, anyone that's reading that report understand the value and ultimately buying down risk any chance that you can and make sure that it's, it's spelled out in there for highlights. I think business en enablement is part of the, the focus that we have mm -hmm. um, in security. Um, you know, cybersecurity is a um, responsibility, a shared responsibility of the entire organization, but we also have to ensure that our partners on the business side can continue to, to provide the services that are needed to our clients and our customers. And so, um, again, I think if you have a shared responsibility mindset and you partner much earlier in the cycle associated with things, um, it becomes a much you know, better, stronger stakeholder relationship. Um, kind of getting away from the gotchas and figuring out how can we collaboratively um, get to a, a, a decision um, you know, collab uh, together versus cyber says you can't do this. It's okay, so how can I accomplish this? I think changing the mindset has been a huge shift mm -hmm. in the partnerships that we have with our business partners. Um, to really ensure that we're not just giving them a list of vulnerabilities they need to patch, but we're helping them with which ones are the priorities based on what's externally exploitable, based on our defense capabilities and efficacy. So really pinpointing that down so we don't just you know, hit them over our head every patch Tuesday with more things, but this is the stuff that you've got to address today because we've done that back work or the back, uh, the uh, back end work to help with the prioritization I think also helps kind of to um, Kim's point. We don't want to just give them a bunch of things, but we want to give them intelligence around why it matters. Well, and I think as security operations folks, there's, I certainly found this with my team. They didn't tell anybody about what was going on. They weren't sharing the security <laughs> incidents. And being able to tell the stories to the business of, hey, this is what happened. So for example, you know, well, gee, if we're doing a riff, we don't want to shut people off, right, because we're a family. Okay, well, let me talk to you about some of the insider threat incidents that have really happened, even if there are examples from industry, right? But if you have those stories, tell them, obviously, with the privacy and the legal. These are things that have happened. These are the costs, right? This happened because we have an insecure application that had 15 security bridges in the past three months, and if you tally up the hours of people from across the business that were involved, this is the cost to the company in addition to those other pieces. So being a little bit more open about what you're doing and tying that together to the cost and the impact I think is really valuable rather than being, you know, kind of sitting behind the closed door with the Mountain Dew and the Cheetos and <laughs> just being the security people. Um, I think it's really helpful in getting the, 
behavior change that you want so you're not constantly dealing with people's stupid mistakes. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's important and just to the extent you continue to hone your skills to be able to, to translate effectively security to business impact is going to go a long way for, for you and your organization. Well, thank you all for, for doing this uh, panel with me today. It's greatly appreciated. Can we get a round of applause for our panelists? Thank you.